Welcome to the Let's Get Personal podcast with your host, Chris DiBella. Joining us today is Karen O'Donnell, the visionary founder of Caring Nurses Staffing Agency in New Hampshire. All right. Well, I'm so happy to be joined by Karen O'Donnell of the Caring Nurses Staffing Agency. This is a area that's close to my heart, not only, not only because here at DiBella Law, we do a lot of you know, all types of areas involving the medical field, but because, you know, two of my aunts were nurses, uh, my niece is in nursing school, we have a lot of friends and family, a lot of clients, quite frankly, that are in the nursing industry, so it's definitely something that I'm very excited to delve into with you. Yeah. Um, you know, so I just want to start by saying, welcome, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. And, um, you know, really, you know, w- w- just to give people a roadmap of where I want to go with this, I... I would love to get to know your background, how you got into nursing, how that evolved into a business, and kind of where you see the future of nursing going. So if you don't mind, maybe just give us a little bit of your, your background and how you got sure. into nursing. Yeah. So I always knew that I wanted to be in healthcare in some aspect or another. So I was thinking maybe occupational therapy, maybe physical therapy. But I had a grandmother who was a nurse. She was an LPN, and she steered me in the direction of nursing. So I went to nursing school in New Hampshire, and at the time that I graduated, um, there were so many nurses out there, and you had to have experience before you could go into a hospital setting. So um, for the first year and a half of my career, I had to work at a rehab center in Boston, Um, got some great experience, but then I was able to then get a job in a hospital. And my goal was to always be an oncology nurse. So I was able to get an oncology nurse job um, working night shift in New Hampshire. And I then had an opportunity to become an emergency room nurse. And at that point, I really had no inkling that I wanted to do that, but it was an opportunity that a friend of mine had introduced me to. So I jumped and became the best decision of my life. I am an ER nurse through and through and still am. So uh, I think most nurses kind of share this experience that I do, that every few years kind of feel like you want to change what you're doing either the setting or the nursing or just change something. So I always kind of had that feel that I wanted to do something else. And I kind of thought I wanted to start my own business. So I did a few different businesses. First off, I was kind of the Uber Eats model that I was gonna do grocery shopping for the elderly. And I did that. It was not a great business model. It was very limited income type thing. But throughout the years, I had different businesses that I had started, never really panned out. And finally, I was like, you know what? I love nursing, and I'm going to continue doing nursing. This was just a side gig. And I'm like, why don't I try to do a business in nursing? So I started on that journey to find out if there were businesses for nursing. A couple of businesses that I was was um, kind of going down was legal nurse consultant. That was an independent nurse job. But I happened upon um, a little resource that said how to start a staffing agency. And I was like, you know, that is my strength, nursing. So why not try to do that? So as an emergency room nurse, I treated it like that. I started getting my resources, trying to figure out how to do a business model. I have no formal business degree. And I just started on my journey to find out how to do it. And that was 12 years ago. That's amazing. And <laughs> 12 years in business is amazing. And it's, I think when you think about, because a lot of people never, they have these ideas mm-hmm. and never act on them. So I think that's, it's an interesting thing to dive in a little bit, maybe scratch the surface about how do you make that leap of, because you know, so many people at home watching and probably think, wow, I'd, I'd love to start my own business. I'd love to work for myself which has its pros and cons, as I'm sure yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but how do, you, how do you get the courage? How do you, you know, so many people get, I think, blocked off by the fact of worrying about what they don't know. So it prevents them from getting into it mm-hmm. rather than getting in there and learning as you go. Yeah. And that's how a lot of people start off. But how do you get to that point 
where you really pulled the trigger on that and how scary was that? I think because I had had um, many different ideas of of businesses that I was I had quote unquote failed before or yep. maybe not put a hundred percent of my effort into it um, for the different businesses that I had tried and you know it was like dabbling in in the business model um, how did I get the courage to do it I just felt that I needed to do something else. And I wanted to have independence. I wanted to have some freedom for my scheduling and to be able to, you know, still work as a nurse, but then also have something else that would make me feel fulfilled, I guess. Right. So um, not sure how I just took the step to jump into it, but I feel like those past kind of, if you want to call them failures, they kind of triggered me to then really go into something that I was more passionate about, which is nursing. So, you know, from that perspective, I created this business with the thought that I'm going to be a nurse first and a business person second. So, you know, as a triage nurse, you got to find out exactly what's going on with somebody by asking the right questions. So you just go down the path and you find out where your resources are. And there are a lot of resources of how to start a business, how to do a business model, how to make a mission statement. You know, that comes in handy, but also to have the passion to be able to know what you want to do. It just is is how your path is created. Yeah. No, I, well, I can tell by reading what's out there on you on the internet, you know, learning a little bit about you that the passion's there. I mean, you you care a lot about the nurses and want to make sure that they're taken care of and that, you know, you're, everyone's mindful about what they're going through and their mental health. And, and I think that really shows and comes through. And obviously, that's a big reason why you've been successful. But so when you make that decision, so obviously, is it connections with hospitals? Is that the first step with creating that need? Or how does that work? It's it's all about relationships yep. and networking. Um, my first contract, and I started this super old school. I literally had brochures made. And when I tell people that, <laughs> they right. laugh. And it's like, okay. That I laugh just only seems... because I have done the same thing. Yeah, yep. it seems antiquated. Yep. But um, I sent out the mailers, and I got a phone call a couple days later from a CNO of one of the local hospitals and I went and met with her and come to find out we went to the same nursing school and we created that bond wow. and 12 years later they are still a contract of mine and it really is more about relationships in my world so that people know if they're going to be you know hiring us for staffing the people that are going to come there as staff are going to be representative of our, of our company. So it's like me cloned everywhere. Um, I, I've been a nurse for over 30 years, so I want people who are very passionate about nursing, who are going to be a good representation. And these people just have found me in many different ways. Um, I've worked in a lot of different hospitals in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, so I have a very big network of people. And when somebody comes to me and says, I want to work for your company, if I have not worked with them, I know somebody who's worked with them. So it's, it's a team that has been organically growing. And they're very, they are people that I would want taking care of me, as well as my family members. So that is how I approach how I bring my team in as well as how I get contracts. So the contracts that we currently have, um, if, if they're going to be a very difficult place for my nurses to work, I don't want to contract with them. And there are places out there that are super short staffed. You know, I mean, that's the whole crux of my business is to provide that extra staffing. But if the current staff that are working there are going to be creating a negative environment for my people. I don't want my people going there. 
My team is there to help them. So if they're going to be getting the worst assignment or they're not going to be getting breaks or they're going to be, you know, struggling for their mental health, then we won't go there. So it's really a connection of both the right facility, the right people, and we all just work together. Well, that, that sounds amazing. So just getting back into the business structure, so do you mm -hmm. place people, are they in there full time? Are they per diem where they're picking up gaps in that facility's staffing needs or? When we started, it was part-time, part-time per diem, like second careers, um, second jobs for the nurses. But COVID changed that quite a bit. Um, we were doing part-time, but then because of the high demand and the need for more full-time travel type contracts, um, we were able to then have other opportunities for our nurses. So more nurses came to me and started wanting a 13 week full-time contract. And I have some nurses that have been on contracts after contracts after contracts with the same hospital. Oh, wow. And sometimes it goes on for years. It's just, yeah. Wow. It, COVID definitely changed the dynamic of, of staffing. We've, in our office, we've definitely seen a, a massive shift or impact that the hospitals have had on, you know, whether it's just the level of care because of the staffing needs or just their ability to respond to different requests we've made. Yeah. And I, I've certainly noticed from our end that staffing has been a major issue. Yeah. How do you, how have you balanced, I think you kind of got into it a little bit earlier about like the mental health and how do you really shield against putting them in that tough situation? Or do you just pull them out once you know? Yeah, if um, if there is a, a situation that, you know, we, from, you know, my team perspective, from the contract perspective, if we decide that it's not a good fit, either personality-wise or just skills-wise, then the contract just ends. So we can easily do that. But it really, we try to all work together so that we create a good situation. Um, but sometimes it just doesn't work out, you know, right. so it's it's different for each individual person in each contract But from a nursing perspective, I didn't really understand this until I actually started doing this, but um, When you are a staff nurse at a hospital you you know are involved in the politics and everything day-to-day -day of the hospital when you are a travel nurse or doing a contract it's a more freeing experience in that you can basically just go in, do your job, do it well. You are the helper. You are an extra resource, and you don't have to be involved in the day-to-day, -day, um, sometimes negativity of places. Right. And you just go home, and then you feel good about your your job. Right. So it's it is very freeing. It makes you feel more independent and in control of what you're doing. Right. And I think that's why that was one of the reasons many people at the beginning of COVID just decided, okay, if I'm going to be in these, you know, tough situations, I'd rather make more money, be in charge of my own, you know, scheduling right. and do that. So the beginning of COVID, there was a huge shift in nurses that just started traveling. And it's really hard to kind of, reel that back in, you know, for hospitals who have, you know, sometimes 80 to 90% of their staff are travelers. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's. And what, what, what do you think it was before COVID? Was it significantly different? Yeah. It was less than 50%. Wow. Yeah. Because I think, you know, not just nursing, but probably the employment world overall, people value flexibility and mm -hmm. being in more control of their schedule and, mm -hmm. You know whether it's working from home or traveling you know to the they, they want to own that a little bit more and i think the model you're providing allows people to to do that yeah more than they probably ever have and yeah. i don't see that going anywhere yeah it's a little different my model of agency because it's local people um you know the bigger companies that are nationwide everybody knows their names you can get a nurse from california coming to new hampshire and there's a huge part of what we need in healthcare to have that model 
But from my perspective, you know, I'm a small local company, so it's literally a nurse that lives in New Hampshire who's going to be working in New Hampshire or, you know, very close to where they are. And it's just an extra resource. So the smaller hospitals are the ones that I have been more contracting with versus the larger ones because I have a smaller team. And it works out better because the smaller hospitals, they need more resources, but they can't afford the bigger companies, so they go with more kind of a local talent type thing. Right. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So what would you, are you looking for nurses at this point? Or are they just finding you as, how do those relationships coalesce between? It's a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, there are times when people will reach out to me and say, hey, you know, I have a friend who's a packing nurse and, you know, she lives here. Do you have anything available? So I come at it from both perspectives. There are times when a facility will, you know, reach out to me and say, do you have any nurses? And I consider it kind of a, a healthcare matchmaking type situation. Right. Sometimes the stars align and sometimes they don't. Right. So if they don't, then I'll keep somebody kind of on the back burner in case an opportunity does, does happen. So it just kind of organically happens from both perspectives. And I, well, that, I love the healthcare matchmaking. That's a great, <laughs> it just is a great way to sum it up. Do you, do your nurses go into all different, are they only in the hospitals? Do they go out into the fields? Are they going to people's homes? Are they doing end of life care? Is it all over the place or? The majority of our staffing is hospitals. Hospitals. Um, we do have home care capability for private, um, private pay type situations. That is less of a model of what our actual business is. It's really the hospitals that are much more in need at this point. Right. Yeah. One of the things that I loved hearing from you at the beginning was that you also still do a little bit yourself hmm. because you like to stay sharp and, and I think that keeps you really connected to what your nurses' needs are and, and yeah. the hospital's needs are. Um, so it's nice that you still like to... I've been around long enough to know that I feel the best managers are the ones that can still do the job. Right. And, you know, not everybody just attend the staff meetings or, you know, does, does the management part of it. But when you can still, you know, get in there and start IVs and, and be a nurse, that is my ultimate goal to continue as long as I can, because I, I don't want to lose my skills. Right. Yeah. So how, how have you seen, so you've been, I think you said 30 years you've been doing this, which is amazing. Um, so you've obviously seen this industry change tremendously, not just with COVID. Yeah. Where, where do you see it? I mean, how has it changed for the better and worse? And where do you see it going in the next 10 years? So when I first started nursing, it was a, it was a nonprofit type healthcare model. And throughout the years, it has changed to a, a profit business. And I guess it had to. So the, the hospitals that are more on the for-profit mentality it's a little bit harder sometimes to work because you have to worry about you know how many band-aids you're giving out versus you know actually taking care of the patients so that i think has been one of the biggest changes um going from from that model i, I think it had to happen because you know hospitals need to make a profit and and right. that but um, it's really, from a nursing perspective, it's kind of hard sometimes to, to go from that model up to now. But there are a lot of rooms that we can improve on. Um, you know, AI is coming and is here. Yeah. I think that I, I kind of joke a couple of years ago when the, they first started introducing the idea of AI coming into healthcare nursing medicine that um, people are worried about that and I said to myself you know what when I'm in a nursing home as a patient I hope that the robots are going to take care of me because <laughs> at least there's going to be somebody to give meds because right. there are going to be no nurses right. you know we're so short-staffed and that's just a, a chronic problem that has been you know going on with healthcare. care um, at the very beginning when I was talking about when I first became a nurse and there were so many nurses that's not a thing anymore. It's really an industry where a lot of people are trying to get into nursing, but there's 
there are twofold problems. There's the um, not having enough nurse educators, so they have to cap at how many nurses can actually go through school. Um, and then, you know, it sometimes the graduation rate is lower, but then also people who are leaving nursing because it's a hard job. It really right. is. So um, a couple of years ago, I heard that 33% of new nurses within the first two years get out of nursing because really? it's just not what they expected right. or, you know, it's just, it, it's a difficult, it's a difficult job sometimes. So, you know, from not being able to get enough nurses into nursing school and then graduate and then the people that are leaving, it's, it's a chronic problem. Wow. And, and that obviously was exposed during COVID because yeah. people are overworked. I mean, I have a lot of clients that are nurses and, um, I always used to hear from my clients that I've helped over the years that they've loved it because it allows them so much flexibility through their life cycle where you might be, you know, starting a family and want to do a couple 12 hour shifts, mm -hmm. but not work five, six days a week. Um, or if you want to, you know, sometimes you want to be in the ER in the hospital or sometimes you want to be a traveling nurse and, yeah. you know, it, it, it's amazing the different things you can do Absolutely. as a nurse with your career. But at the same point, I think I'm, I've heard the same thing that you're, you're hearing obviously a lot closer, but I'm hearing it just from people that I know that have worked in the industry about how, you know, so much of the stress of the industry has fallen on them because they, you know, I mean, listen, we've all been in hospitals. We see how they run the hospitals, you know, not to say that doctors don't have a massive role in it, but the day to day in and out, 90% of the care you're getting is given by nurses, yeah. you know, and, and, um, I hate to hear because I, I just went in for a procedure in the Boston and they make nurses make the experience and it's, they make you feel comfortable. It's a scary time in people's lives typically. And they are social workers, they're medical providers, mm -hmm. they're therapists, they're, they're all that in one. And you really can't, they don't operate without good nurses. And it, it's sad to hear that, you know, that there is an outflow of that and, yeah. Where, where do you think that, do you think that ends? Do you think there's more of a push in these colleges to get people into that field or how does that get rectified? There's definitely a fair amount of recruiting that, you know, that different nursing facilities are doing. There's, um, you know, going from the education part of it, there, the LPN programs are, are getting back, you know, to a little bit more of a need. So, for a while, um, it was all about you know being a registered nurse, being a bachelor prepared registered nurse. But right. the fact that it's limited in terms of being able to bring as many people in, um, LPN programs are coming back again. So you know two years versus four years, and to be able to to use you know the people who start off their nursing career in those type of roles and then, you know, graduate to RN if they want to, there's still a need there. But for a few years, they were being pushed out of the nursing world because they wanted only RNs. So that is coming back now, as well as more nursing assistant programs. So there's a fair amount of kind of disbursement of different duties now. Um, nurse practitioner programs are becoming much more much more popular again. Uh, physician assistant, you know, they're not nurses, but you know, more people to get into healthcare, the better because our, our jobs are changing. You know, there are AIs that are coming about that are going to be doing more kind of the the mundane nursing duties that, you know, we don't have time for anymore because we have to document everything because right. we're right at the bedside. So, you know, I think embracing AI as well as the different kinds of programs that are out there in healthcare, I think that really is important. Um, and I think that knowing that it's a very flexible job, like you were saying, um, if you go into emergency nursing and then you, you get sick of that, you want to change, you can go into ICU, you can go into education, you can go into so many different realms of nursing that if you need to have the flexibility to do something else, you can. So the thing about AI that I know is that you'll never, ever not have nurses. 
Never. Right. You know, you can have a robot that's going to come give you your meds, but you're not going to not have somebody who would be able to hold your hand, right. who would be able to, you know, start an IV to be able to give you the emotional support. And there are so many aspects of nursing that, like you were saying, the, the social work, the case management that, that we do just on a day-to-day -day basis that can't be outsourced. You can't replace. <laughs> it, it's, it's funny you say that because we've in integrated a lot of AI in our business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, initially a lot of staff was resistant to it. And I said, you're not going to be replaced by AI, but you're going to be replaced by somebody that embraces AI. Because it, to your point, it's going to allow, hopefully, I would imagine your industry, that it's going to free up the nurses to maybe spend more time on care. And, you know, I have a dear friend that um, she spends so much time after her workday doing paperwork. Yeah, It's almost another day. Yeah. And, you know, it, certainly in the legal field, we know how important it is to document that stuff. But there's, yeah. if there are ways to, you know, lessen the load of that administrative side on mm -hmm. nurses, I'm sure everyone would be grateful for that. Yeah. Um, but so... So obviously AI is being introduced, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, I don't, there's certain jobs and I have three kids coming into the business world and, and, you know, trying to figure out careers. And I think there's all this talk about what is AI going to replace? And I don't see how they could ever come after nursing because it's just, it's the human element that you're never going to get from anywhere else. And that's the most important part of, mm -hmm. I mean, from an outsider, it's, you know, the compassion, the, the love, the empathy, the care that you get that you're not going to be able to get anywhere else. So I'd say you're AI proof, I would think. <laughs> but you brought up a, a, a good point. You know, it's funny when I was preparing for this and, and I've experienced the fact that there are so many variations of nurses with the, the LPNs, the RNs, the uh, physician's assistant. And, you know, um, are you placing only RNs? Or are you, does, is that expanding or do you see that changing? At this point, we, we place nursing assistants, um, LPNs, RNs. I've actually also expanded into like respiratory therapists. So it really is whoever I can find and what the need is. Right. Um, there is a higher model of providers, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, um, locum type doctors that is a different agency model. Um, that I haven't delved into just because it's all about kind of credentialing and a little bit more in-depth type things that I would rather just stick with the nurses. Um, but, you know, phlebotomists, other, other skilled technicians like that, right. yeah, we can definitely, if, if I can find them and find the need, then, yep, we can absolutely help with staffing for that too. Wow, well, that's, that's a broad spectrum. And I, I only see... It growing for you to the extent that I know you, you love keeping it personal and having that personal touch on it but that's seems like that's an area that's going to continue to grow and evolve yeah I, I don't want to get away from that whole perspective again I want to take care of my team as well as taking care of my patients so the model of uh, you know big agencies. Um, I've worked with many nurses who, even before I started my own agency, um, they were doing travel. And even throughout the time that I have been working um, with my agency, that uh, travel nursing is, it's all about the relationships, like we were saying. But the bigger companies, they have a different model. They just want to, you know, place people by the thousands and you know when you are when you're dealing with people when you're dealing with nurses I feel like it's it should be that personal approach so you know nurses I've worked with they will approach a company see an assignment they'll have to deal with like 10 recruiters and then the next week only five of the recruiters are, are there and they're not looking out for the nurses best interest they're looking out for the business best interest so it's all about more quantity versus quality and in my in my line of work you know just again being a nurse first I don't want to do that um, I know that there are other models out there saying that you know 
uh, you can you can order a nurse, <laughs> right. and you know I think that there is a place for that because bigger hospitals they need a hundred nurses today, they don't just need a couple of nurses. But when I when I hire somebody or when I contract with a place, they know that the people that are going to be coming are potentially going to be there for longer than just their assignment because they're really good really good practitioners. Right. So. I always want to kind of keep that. That really makes a lot of sense to me because you, you have sometimes you you think about the pandemic and hopefully we don't go through another massive um, health issue like that. But you know that's going to ramp up need immensely and people are just looking to fill gaps and and you're coming at it in much more of a you know local hospital community focused community facing. You know how do we get you know people that care people that are also representing that hospital. They know what your company represents and they want that those like-minded people representing their industry. You're not going to get that when you're doing, you know, 100 people at a time. Um, but, you know, I, I could see to your point how there's a need at certain times for that. Yep. But there's very much a need for what you're providing and um, that's something that those bigger companies probably can't provide at the level you have because you simply, you know, you, you just can't. Um, it's the you get the Walmart version. You have more of the boutique personal side of it, which Walmart can't do the same way. True. Um, what you know, looking back, if you were to talk to your sixteen year old self or a sixteen year old person looking to go into the nursing field, what what would be your advice? My advice would be that it's an incredibly rewarding career, and you know, to never lose sight of the fact that you're doing this for a reason that you want to take care of somebody that you are a natural caregiver. And if that is your number one priority to say, okay, I, I want to go into a career that I know that I will probably be in until I retire, you know, versus get bored. Um, but if that is your number one answer is, do I want to help people? Do I want to take care of people? then this is the career for you. So looking back, I had that thought and I knew that I was, you know, empathetic and really had that nurturing type feel. So it was a natural progression for me. Um, I had no idea that I would go into business (laughs) or be at this end, but I think that it is incredibly rewarding to take care of people and to be able to help them through a time of need. And especially in the emergency department, that's their, their worst crisis ever. Right. That, you know, to, to not lose sight of the fact that we're taking care of people and that we're not just taking care of widgets. You know, you're, you're there for their time of need and that, if you can help that person, is incredibly rewarding, and it it just keeps you going, right? You know, and if you have somebody who loses sight of that, they probably shouldn't be taking care of you. It makes sense, and yeah, because you do. It, I'm sure as you're in the industry for periods of time, you need to find ways to maybe pivot and reignite that fire that you had and maybe it's switching within the industry and you know as people grow you know it's nice that in that industry you maybe you can start off caring for babies and then you're uh, can you move that fluidly within those areas you can yeah yeah i mean you know you're not going to be proficient at it on day one right if you you know started off doing something else so you learn different skills in whatever specialty you're going to but that's the beauty of it that if you do get you know to the point where you have lost the empathy are burnt out and it happens to everybody then you can pivot and switch to something else that will spark your interest again and you know going from being an expert at one field and then changing and being you know, the newly orienting to another field that is also very rewarding so that you can learn a new skill, but, right. you know, reignite that passion that you once had. And I think that's important for everything we do in life anyway, that you need to constantly 
find new challenges anytime you're getting too comfortable. Yeah. You know, it's nice to challenge yourself, learn some new skill sets and broaden the spectrum of experience that you're, you're having. What, you know, I know with lawyers, there's burnout, there's people that, um, turn to alcohol and other things. Are, are there mechanisms in place? I know there are in the law to help people that are getting burnt out, that are stressed, that are, you know, struggling at a stage in the career. What resources are available to nurses? Well, I think it's a it's a constant struggle for nurses because we're good at taking care of everybody else. Right. We don't really think about ourselves right. most often. So to have, you know, the thought of that self-care and, you know, to get a massage as often as possible, to do yoga, to meditate. There are many different things that we can do. Um, we very often will just, you know, have support groups where we will get together with our friends and just, you know, have the, the type of camaraderie that it takes to be involved in a traumatizing situation sometimes that you just need to talk about with somebody who knows exactly what you've gone through. So that I think is huge in terms of how we decompress is that we just literally need to kind of have a healthcare confessional. Right. <laughs> we need to kind of talk sometimes, you know, by going out to breakfast to having those relationships of people who do the same thing day in and day out that maybe a spouse doesn't understand because they haven't gone through, you know, having somebody who, who's just died in front of you and right. you have to then move on to the next patient. Um, so I think the support network is, is huge, but again, we are our worst patients. We can't um, very often stop and think, I'm getting overloaded, I'm getting super stressed, I'm drinking too much caffeine, I'm not getting enough sleep. So I think the constant reminders to people that you need to take care of yourself is a little bit more of what I try to do to just make sure that the mental health of these amazing healthcare workers is not at risk just because of the things that we see and do every day. Yeah. And it's really, it's hard to continue to do because, you know, it's easy to cancel your massage appointment because you just picked up another shift, you right. know. But it's, it's definitely harder for people who are just regularly taking care of everybody else not to take care of themselves. You know, one of the things that we haven't touched on yet is that obviously you guys see nurses in the medical field see a lot of different things ranging from uh, in the ER. One of my college roommates was a ER doctor, still is. And uh, the stories I used to hear, uh, you know, of what they would experience on a day to day, anything stick out in your mind over the years of nursing? Uh, there are a few, a few things. Um, so it's funny because from an emergency nurse perspective, it's all about the stories and trying to <laughs> not one up each other but to know that your experience is it's sometimes it's sometimes traumatizing um so when you're when you're seeing people in their worst situations sometimes you just can't help but to feel really um you have to have you have to have a professional distancing because it's not your family that you're taking care of but sometimes to just be in the room with somebody who is dying whose family members are crying sometimes you have to cry with them and you know you don't always have that that professional distancing so there have been some times when I've taken care of people and cried alongside them with their family. Um, when I first started at a very large trauma center, I had been working at a smaller hospital before that in the ER. So coming to a bigger hospital with more opportunities and um, more traumas and things like that, uh, there was one particular situation that happened that um, a patient came in who was just in a car accident. And we got the report from EMS that 
uh, patient was coming in and there were certain details that they were sharing and the patient was was coming in and was basically dead and we tried to work that that case so much and um, there were so many people in the room trying to save this person and it just it didn't we could not save her she was just um, she was gone from the beginning um, so it's, it's really hard sometimes when you have those situations that keep replaying um, certainly there are times when you have really good outcomes and you feel good about that but there are definitely times when people um, don't survive and you just have to know that we are all going to be there at some point um, and that it's a finite amount of time that we're here so to make the most of it is great but from a perspective of caregiver who is trying to you know take care of loved ones um, sometimes you lose the distancing and yeah it it becomes hard sometimes I that's I can only imagine you know that's so hard to you know that's obviously a story from many years ago that you haven't forgotten and what never will forget and that's part of who you are now and that we probably have many like that um, on a, on a lighter note, it also sounds like in the legal world, people all, always ask, you know, is it really like law and order? But it, on your end, it sounds like it might be like Grey's Anatomy, one of those where there's, you constantly see these very traumatic, you know, life-threatening things rolling in the ER on a regular basis if you're in a busy trauma center. Yeah. Is that really, um, does it get that busy and that stressful on it it can yeah. yeah yeah there's a there's a constant chaos that's going on in the ER and if you've worked there long enough um, it becomes a routine chaos but occasionally there's something else that happens the most rewarding thing about the ER is that you don't always know what's going on so you're trying to find the pieces of the puzzle and you don't always have all of them to complete the puzzle so you have to be a detective and you know find out through diagnostics what your end result is going to be so right. that is the most interesting part of it um, but if you've been doing it for a while you know a chest pain comes in it's going to be the same thing as another chest pain and right. you just you just have a little bit of a routine to it which is um, it's very rewarding to be able to uh, to start off with nothing and then to figure it out as you go along so that in the end you have your diagnosis, you have your treatment, and most often you make people feel better. So I can tell you still have a love for the ER. <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> and it, it's just such an odd story of how I, how I went to the ER. You know, I touched on it a little bit. I thought I wanted to be an oncology nurse forever. And I was doing it for three years, and I got to the point where I felt like everybody in the world had cancer, you know, because right. that was my world. And I had an opportunity to go into the emergency room with a colleague of mine, and I'm like, I don't want to do that. That just sounds crazy. No. But right. then I, I interviewed, and then I'm like, okay, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll do this now. And it just it opened up a whole new world that I had no idea that I actually would love. I, so. you know, just from a complete layperson obviously I've been in the ER many times for both myself and my kids but I could see that being depending on which ER you're in being an area that has higher turnover or something because it the stress level seems to be so high so much more of the time than you might experience in a you know in oncology or other areas where it's you're kind of always getting an emergency you know yeah and that that's got to be difficult it is, but I think that different personalities thrive right. in the True. ER, and yeah. you're drawn to it, you right. know, so there are people who definitely like the adrenaline rush of it and like to, you know, be involved in those high acuity patients, and yeah, I think that it's... Yeah. I can see from your smile, you're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's Some driving days. That. Yeah. Some days, yeah. <laughs> but uh, there, there is, there is a... A part to it that um, that does kind of become routine. Yep. And I'll tell you another story that. Um, uh, so for many many years, I've been 
when I was working down at that trauma center, and I was, it was Leahy Clinic. Amazing, amazing place to work. Um, so there were a fair amount of us who um, had been a group of people who were volunteering at the Boston Marathon. And I was able to kind of slide into one of the positions of the woman who was retiring. So it, so I started volunteering. And um, so I started volunteering in 2012. And then the next year, 2013, was the year that the bombing happened. Wow. And so the medical tent at the end of the, of the race is basically... You know, you take care of like 3,000 runners in a year. And that those 3,000 runners are there for like muscle cramps and things like that. Usually nothing too high acuity. Um, and it's an amazing group of people who just go there. It's like a, it's like a mass unit, you know. So nurses, physicians, all of these people go and volunteer every year. And it's, it's a prestigious type thing. And it's just unbelievable. So that year, um, it was certainly different um, that we're not just taking care of uh, people with muscle cramps. So you worked the year of the bombing? I did. I did. Um, but from a protective mechanism, when everything started happening, people started coming into the tent and then we would you know, stabilize them and they moved on. Um, I had the thought that this is like my my worst trauma day I'm at work again right. and we, everybody that I worked with who was volunteering we all went into work mode right. and just took care of the people that we could and then stabilized them and moved them out so it was I feel that the amount of time that I'd worked in the ER helped me so that I could just go to work that day right. and to help the people that were there who were who were bomb victims. Well, I mean, I think to f be able to flip the switch like you did and jump right into action where people's instinct is to run from something like that and yours is to get to work, it just speaks to this industry. You know, I, I've seen... I ran the marathon in 2004 and it holds a special place in my heart. We obviously all watch that and just watching first responders like yourself or the medical, they were even doctors that were running, that running back into the line of fire to help people. Yeah. It's just, it's, uh, you know, it, it's amazing. You, you hope that if we were all faced with something like that, that we would, and I guess you don't know unless you try it, or well, not that you try it, that you experience it, which we hope we never have to. But to hear that you just click into gear, that's just an amazing... It was very strange yeah. <laughs> how it it's, happened. It's amazing, but that's yeah. we're grateful to have people like yourself that, you know, how, how does society operate without, you know, yeah. heroes like yourself that, that do that? It, when I think every cell in your body is telling you to get to safety, you're putting yourself in harm's way to help other people. It's amazing. But that's that's quite a story. It was it was a crazy time, and everybody, the majority of people who were there that day, have still been going back every year. It's like hope the volunteers, you mean? Yeah. Like yourself. Yeah. Have you been back since? Yep, every yeah. year. Oh wow. Yep. That's amazing. It's a great day. Wow. <laughs> what was, you know, you don't have to get into it if you're not comfortable. But what was that? Daylight. How long were you there? Were you there quite a bit of time after it happened? Um, so we were, we were there for about an hour, hour and a half afterwards. So the way that the tent is set up is that right at the finish line, if somebody is like struggling, if they're passing out, things like that, then they go in, there are two tents. So the first tent is right at the finish line. Um, so, so basically it's kind of, you know, healthy people who just ran 26 miles and right. we kind of stabilize them and then they just walk out. Um, so it was the two tents um, and basically it, 
we just kind of stabilize and if people need to go to the hospital then they will so ems is kind of at the end of at the end of the tent so um so yeah it just basically was like throughput people just you know were coming through and the amount of resources that happened that day it it was almost like a perfect storm that if something was going to happen that day this was where it should have happened because it was patriots day all of the hospitals were very light in their operating rooms because they don't do operations on Patriots Day. Um, it was change of shift around that time, so there was double the staff at almost every hospital, wow. and we were within um, blocks of six huge trauma centers. Wow. That that's why people survived. So you're you're hundreds of feet probably from where the bombs went off. Did you know what it was right away? No. Because I mean, that's not something you would think would be in your psyche of something that would happen. No. Um, we we heard something and everything just kind of, our, our tent was full of, of people, of runners. We heard something and then we were like, it was kind of silent. And then a few seconds later, there was another sound and it was still silent and then we all just kind of were like, okay, we need to figure out what's going on. And there was an announcer in our tent and he's like, okay, just take care of your people. We'll figure out what's going on. And people started just kind of coming in and EMS already has a mechanism in place of mass casualty type situations. So they clicked in within seconds and we just kind of followed what they were doing. We had people who were able to, you know, walk. So they were our patients, they walked out and we just started taking care of the next people that were coming in. And it just, EMS really kind of created the scene so that we just kind of followed what they were, they were doing. And then they just brought people to the hospitals. So somebody point. from EMS notified you that a bomb had gone off and then you just started seeing a flood of people coming in? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and they were, at one point, the announcer was, was asking people to go out to, you know, help get more people. So we started doing that, but then there was more of an influx of people coming in. So it was just basically figuring out how to triage people, how to just, and, and we, had, we had no supplies. We had supplies to start IVs on people. We didn't have dressings. We didn't really have anything wow. except, like, blankets and you know, the most basic things, because that's not what we used to see. Yeah. So you just used whatever you had available? Mm -hmm. and People took their belts off. They were creating tourniquets and just, yeah, it was, wow. it was a very amazing experience, amazingly terrible, but. It, but it, it, it's amazing too, the, the acts of kindness and love and people jumping into action that come out of those experiences that you've also experienced which is the yeah. great part of humanity yeah well, that's that's something i'm sure amongst all the other memories you have will probably stay around the top i guess yeah well, yep. thank you for being there that day it's amazing that you're still going back and it's one of the things i love about the nursing community but the medical community and, and you hit on it earlier because it it crosses borders it crosses state lines it's just when you know somebody's in the field you probably have a sense of the type of person they are you also have probably an immediate camaraderie with them yeah right and that it's it's there's not too many fields where you know i don't want to crap on another area but you know an engineer from new york just because he meets one in you know california is not going to have probably that same instant connection that there's a bond i think that connects caregivers yes. and first responders because of shared experience that quite frankly most of the worlds don't go most of the world's population doesn't go through and have to experience and you have an immediate respect and understanding of what they've sacrificed and who they are and it's uh it's amazing to see the people that are in that community like yourself but that's that's an amazing story well whenever i hear that somebody is going into nursing i just applaud them you yeah. know, because we we need more nurses, we need more caregivers, and you know whether or not it's 
you know, starting out as a nursing assistant and then, you know, going through the ranks or anybody in healthcare, you know, there's, there's a special need that we have to take care of other people and it's a calling. It's not just a career. So, you know, it is, it's incredibly rewarding and to be able to take care of people makes you feel so good. Yeah. It, it kind of struck me a little bit when you said, um, you know, you watch somebody die and then you have to move on and, you know, we, we do a lot of injury law here and we're dealing with horrific stories about people being injured and, and seeing how the struggles that the families are going through, but it's still a step removed, a big step removed from where you guys are at, where you're seeing the trauma firsthand. You're seeing the trauma of the family reacting or the trauma of that patient. And I can't even remember, I can't even imagine that next level of intensity because even all of our staff have to rely on each other to talk about because we're similar to, to you guys in the sense yeah. that we were a small firm that prides ourselves on the personal touch and being as close to family to that, that injured party as you can. And um, you do internalize a lot of it more than you probably realize. And um, I, I can't imagine being on that front line the way that nurses have to be day in and day out and the amazing energy that they bring every day um, I'm always blown away by it, and uh, you know my, you know my grandmother was a nurse also, and it's just, it definitely runs deep in our family. But I think it's such a special skill to be that person that's so selfless, like you were saying, to give back and to put other people first. I mean, there's not a lot of industries that are so altru altruistic and and selfless like the nursing field is. So I, yeah, thank you very much for everything you do, um, you know, just, just to, to wrap up, is there anything about the nursing industry, how you see it, that it's changing, that you guys are addressing with the company or personally as a nurse or things that you're adapting to? It's, it's constantly changing. Um, healthcare is constantly changing, the technology. So to continue to keep updated with that is definitely important. Um, I'm looking to, in the future, in the near future, create a support network for um, nurses to actually potentially start their own nursing agencies and to help to support that. So I'm creating an educational platform as well as networking type situations so that we can all work together because nursing is a very close-knit community and when when businesses come at us from a business perspective we're a little bit leery about that and I would rather create more companies like myself that put the nurse first versus the business first so I really I'm looking to create that sort of platform so that I can help support more nurses going into their own business it's the you're extending your selflessness into the business world, which is probably not it's not as apparent in a lot of industries, which is amazing. And um, that sounds like a great idea. And I, I love everything that you're doing online and the, the way that you care so deeply. It's so evident. And I think that that's, you know, the nursing field is lucky to have you. And I, I, I can't wait to continue to watch the growth um, that, that caring nurses is going to continue to have. And helping others is just an amazing way to continue that, paying it forward. But I love your entrepreneurial spirit. I don't know where, <laughs> it, like, it, you seem like you have an insatiable appetite to continue to do more, you know, which is which is great. Where does that come from? I, I <laughs> really a, don't a know. Is that a parent thing? Is that... I, I don't know. Um, so my mother was a social worker. Yep. And my father was a police officer. And I think that, you know, from both of their perspectives, as well as my grandmother, just, you know, helping people really just like lights my fire, you know, and yep. whether or not that's a person that is, you know, in the line at the supermarket who, you know, is like struggling to walk versus, you know, somebody that I'm taking care of in the emergency room versus somebody that I can help to, you know, 
have a better experience with their nursing career by having opportunities for them. It just, it all just kind of comes full circle and just, it, it makes me feel good to help other people. And I think that is, is why I do it. I don't know. <laughs> what better way to, to wrap it up? I mean, that's, I could talk about this all day, but I, I, I love, I wish I could continue to grab some of your energy and throw it into, into my business as well, because it's just that selfless, caring, constant need to help others is just, we need more of that in every industry. And well, it's, you do. You already take care of people in your career. And, yeah. you know, I think that, I think that you have, you know, a bit of nursing in you. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I think there's something to that. Uh, you know, I think, the, you know, a lot of the staff probably feel that same way, but it's just, you know, how just think about our daily interactions with so many businesses and where that could be, you know, a game changer, where if, to your point, you're, you're leading as a nurse who knows the nurse's needs, leading with empathy, where if you had certain industries that you just changed that business model and led with that, you probably could take over a whole area because there's so many businesses are bottom dollar, care about, mm. you know, just continuing to grow at the expense of, you know, how many Band-Aids, but, you know, it's everything's bottom line and it's not cutting corners and reducing cost and, you know, I think the the personal touch has gotten lost so much in the yeah. corporatization of every area, right? When you and I grew up, you know, or at least I can speak for myself, there, there was a local hardware store, local pharmacy, mm -hmm. you know, nowadays everything's a big corporate entity and they're, you can't just walk into the local pharmacist and know them the same way or... Yeah. It's walk true. into the local hardware store and say, hey, the door's falling off. What do you need? It's, you got to hope somebody is in the right aisle, you know, right. and, <laughs> in a massive, you know. So I, I think true. we've lost that over my lifetime. Mm. Um, not all, not all industries, certainly not, not yours and not what you're trying to do. But I think your energy and your approach to business would greatly serve so many others out there. Well, I can be the nurse for the business world. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you for enlightened a lot of people about what, what's going on in the nursing field. And I'm happy that uh, we got to spend some time with you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Awesome. As always, Thanks for joining Let's Get Personal. If you know someone who might like this episode, please share it with them and review us on iTunes as it really helps us to get the word out. And don't forget to like and subscribe to Let's Get Personal with Chris DiBella on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are downloaded.